I, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Stephen Knapp, or Sri Nandanandana Dasa, has been studying the major Vedic texts of India and practicing yoga and Eastern teachings since 1971. He was initiated by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada in 1976. He has traveled throughout India extensively and has a collection of over 18,000 slides and images of the many holy places, temples, historical sites and festivals he has been to. He has authored almost 50 well-received books on different aspects of Vedic culture and Eastern spirituality and history, along with numerous articles. He has also been involved in the management of various Krishna temples for over 40 years and was the founding president of the Vedic Friends Association in 2001, which he chaired for 15 years. Sri Nandanandanaji, may I ask you to please share with us a brief history of BFA, highlighting accomplishments during your tenure as the first president? I guess I have to, don't I? <laughs> we would like you to. <laughs> sure, no problem. Anyway, thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you for establishing this uh, video conference and for all the participants that are here. And uh, to give you a little bit of a, the history of the VFA, uh, the VFA started, uh, well, back in, uh, I think, 1999, really, where we were thinking that uh, some of us, uh, like myself, David Frawley, uh, other people were also advocating and trying to explain the nature of the Vedic culture as uh, eloquently and as effectively as possible. And we we're all kind of working alone. So one of the things we were thinking of is we could all kind of band together to give us each other some support. So we could support each other and then also uh, group together so that if other people came forward and wanted to know about different aspects of Vedic culture, whether it be uh, Vastu, Jyotish, um, Ayurveda, yoga, uh, whether it's uh, Jnana yoga, Hatha yoga, Bhakti yoga, whatever, uh, there'd be like some professionals, not, not necessarily professionals, but those that are uh, masters in that area that could explain this uh, much more effectively. And uh, that way we could have a, a, like a group that could support each other, uh, advocate what each other is doing, and then allowing students to come forward and pick out which authority they would want to take lessons from, so to speak. So uh, how it got started was at a thinkers meet in Hyderabad, India. And uh, this thinkers meet had some of the most uh, famous, eloquent and well-known writers of the Vedic tradition that were known at the time. These were journalists, uh, authors, uh, uh, people who had uh, regular uh, articles in newspapers and magazines. And, uh, and the security was very high there at the time. I think, uh, Vamana Dave, you probably remember that. That was when Manoharlal Joshi was there. And the security was really intense. Everybody had to go through intense security to get in, to get out, because it was uh, held at a, a wing of a hospital. And uh, I was also thinking, you know, I mean, all, all that would have to happen is for the word to get out that we were having this because it was very exclusive. It was invitation only. And so, uh, and, and a good third of it w was uh, Westerners that were there. And uh, I was thinking all it would take is like one bomb to blow this place up and half of the, you know, major writers and uh, Vedic advocates would, would be gone, just disappeared. But uh, but anyway, we had a meeting there, a separate meeting at the time, and that's when we formed the idea. There was about, God, there must have been about 18 of us or so, and that was when we formed the idea of the Vedic Friends Association. Now, the whole point of the Vedic Friends Association was DJ and I, we were in Detroit at the time, VJ Gunapa, and we were thinking, okay, what should we call ourselves? And we were thinking, going through all these different names, you know, names that would imply what we wanted to do without it sounding too, should I say, radical or, you know, uh, revolutionary or whatever. Uh, but we wanted to be friends. We wanted to have all the different aspects of Vedic culture uh, come together under this one banner and be friends because, you know, our point was that it's all part of the Vedic tradition. 
you know, whatever aspect that you was, whether you were Brahmanandis, uh, Shaktis, Shaktas, or uh, Vaishnavs, uh, Shaivites, it didn't matter. It was all part of the Vedic tradition. And they were all just as legitimate as the other. Uh, so we wanted to be friends in that way. So then anyway, we came up with the name Vedic Friends Association so that uh, it would give the impression of what we were really trying to do. So then uh, in 2001, we incorporated as the Vedic Friends Association. We got a lawyer and incorporated it as a 501c3. And then uh, that's when I became the president. And then we would enroll members. Uh, and we had, uh, at one point, we had over 450 members, maybe 480 members worldwide. Of course, the whole object was to try to introduce this to as many Westerners as we could. But in our attempt to do that, you know, I also established uh, a website, you know, and it had the different aspects of uh, what the Vedic Friends Association was all about, who some of our main uh, members were, uh, some of the, uh, and as people would join, they would get a, uh, a, a monthly journal through the email. So then I would have a few editions of the journal on the website and uh, things like that. So people could get a well-rounded idea of what the Vedic Friends Association was all about, what they would get as a member, uh, what we would do. And of course, the first few years, we also had our own conferences. We had our own VFA conferences at certain places. Um, and so people could become a part of that. And, uh, and we also had a chat group for several years, but Unfortunately, the chat group uh, descended into more of an argument group, and we thought, well, this isn't really serving our purpose. So after con so, some consideration with Jeffrey, we had talked about it at the time, and we thought, well, there's no real point in continuing that. So we discontinued it. And uh, so then we also came out with one of the things I was most interested in was getting a book together. Uh, with all the different members who are experts in their field of Vedic activity to contribute something. And then we came out with a book called Vedic Culture, The Difference It Can Make in Your Life. And, uh, and that's still available. In fact, I just re-edited it, uh, changed the publisher. So now it's more available than ever before through Amazon as both paperback and Kindle editions. And it has chapters on, you know, the uh, through many of our different uh, writers on Vastu, Jyotish, you know, um, uh, uh, Vedic science, uh, from uh, Michael Cremo to Professor Subhash Kak to uh, Jeffrey uh, was in there, David Frawley wrote the foreword, and uh, a number of other people were also a part of that book and would give different ways and different uh, introductions into the avenues that Vedic culture has to offer for developing our highest potential in whatever way we want it, uh, which everybody is always trying to do anyway. So, and I still think this is a very good book at introducing all the different avenues of self-development that Vedic culture has to offer. So I'm glad this is uh, now more available than uh, ever before. And, uh, and some of us would also uh, participate in lecture tours going across India, and in which case we would in, uh, try to encourage everyone, especially the Indian Hindus uh, at the time, to preserve, protect, promote, and eventually perpetuate the Vedic culture of India and to make sure that India remains the dynamic homeland of the Vedic tradition. And uh, so we did uh, a number of tours as organized by some of the main uh, associations and organizations in India at the time. I remember uh, two years in a row, we went up into the Northeast. Uh, the first lecture tour I ever did was with Professor Subhash Kak when we went to the middle area of India, central India, on a, about a two week tour. And he gave uh, lectures on the scientific, ac scientific aspect of Vedic culture. And I would give lectures based on my impressions you know, just from the heart, what it's done for me and how it can do the same for other people. So that if people didn't care for the scientific aspect or if it went to over everybody's head, then I would come down to something that was more personal related. 
And so together, we really did, a, a, I think, a very nice job in doing that. And uh, most people all like that. But that was the first time I ever got used to getting in front of an Indian audience, a purely Indian audience in India, talking about their tradition. And the bolder I got, the more confidence I had, the more people liked it. And you could always tell how many people would come up afterwards and talk to you about how, what their impression of was of what you gave to talk. And I remember by the time we got to Vijayawada, uh, there was like some politicians that were there, like the mayor of the city and the chief minister and this and that. And uh, I gave a rather bold talk about the importance of Vedic culture and the profound nature and depth of Vedic culture. And afterwards, somebody came up to me and she, he said, you know, when you were talking like that, I felt like you were the return of Vivekananda. <laughs> and, you know, of course, I'm not trying to be Vivekananda or anything, but you can understand the uh, depth of their, because obviously that's a very high compliment. So, uh, in that regard, uh, I could tell that I was, you know, starting to reach people through that means of communication. So I was very uh, happy about that. And, um, and we kept going for a number of uh, years on in that way. And I've practically been to different conferences or lecture tours or something like that every year. Of course, I'm not as active in India, in India as, uh, uh, David Frawley is, Amaradev Shastri, but uh, uh, still it's been exciting to continue to go there and participate in conferences, lecture tours, things like that, and see parts of India that practically I never would have been able to before, like in the, in the Northeast region, which I really like because the people up there are very sincere, very uh, humble, uh, be it at the same time, desperate in a way to continue to hold on to their tradition which is completely being challenged by so many different uh, other religions or political groups or whatever. And that was when I got the idea of uh, writing more for an Indian audience. Before that, I'd always wanted to write for a Western audience. But after that, I became co uh, coordinated, you might say, to write for a more Indian audience after understanding the challenges that many parts of India are facing because of various, uh, whether it be conversion tactics or uh, government uh, affiliations that don't really care for Hinduism at all, and how we need to continue to protect, preserve, promote, and perpetuate this tradition. Mm. So uh, in that way, uh, I've also continued to write several more books, uh, <clears throat> whether it's be Crimes Against India, uh, The Advancements of Ancient India's Vedic Culture, uh, proof of Vedic Culture's Global Existence, uh, which, by the way, for this next month is having, Amazon is having a special on the Kindle version of that book in India, where you can get that for only 149 rupees to download it to your Kindle edition. So if anybody's interested, they can do that for the next month of October. And uh, so I became more oriented towards writing for the Indian audience to inspire them and be an example of the determination to continue to make uh, and show the profound nature and practicality of what Vedic culture has to offer, as we've tried to do uh, in all of the efforts of the Vedic Friends Association. So, I mean, all of the writers, all of the affiliates and the VFA have also uh, continued to work in that way in whatever way they can. And not only are we an organization to help each other do that, but continually We've all been individuals working in our own capacity, in our own efforts, in our own programs to continue to uh, reach as many people as possible, to continue to show what Vedic culture has done for us and ultimately what Vedic culture can do for you and for the world. So in an essence, I don't know if that's about how much time I've got, but <laughs> in essence, that's what the Vedic Friends Association started out to be and, and continues to be. The one reason why I stepped down from being the Vedic president, the president of the Vedic Association is because I was getting a little older and uh, I was uh, just kind of running out of energy in some ways. I was doing the taxes, keeping up the 501c3, doing the Vedic Friends Association journal, uh, maintaining the website, maintaining the members, 
And uh, I was starting to think that uh, maybe somebody else should start to, you know, take up some of these responsibilities um, and share the load, you might say, uh, so that we could, uh, so I could continue to be more effective in other areas as well. So uh, that's when we, we twisted Balabhadra's arm to uh, take up the cause. And, and so far he's uh, coming in and doing a pretty good job. So I feel like I can sit back and get back to my own, my own sadhana, my own personal spiritual growth and continue to work in ways uh, of my own writing and stuff like that to continue my, my uh, efforts of uh, the job of what I call the four purrs, which is preserving, protecting, perpetuating, and promoting uh, the profound nature of what Vedic culture has to offer. So that in a nutshell, I think, is the how the Vedic Friends Association got started, uh, where it's going, what its purpose is, and uh, we're still open to collecting members and uh, bringing more people on board uh, to help out with this cause and to show other people, Westerners in particular, but also Indians when they're interested in uh, what Vedic culture has done for us. And if it can do it for us, then it can do it practically for anybody. So uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. So thank you very much. Jai Sri Krishna. Thank you very much, Srinandana Ji. That was awesome.